everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a real inspiration to hear the wonderful work that is going on, um, especially on a practical level. Um, and hopefully my work, which um, kind of floats into a series of spaces, but mainly it's to do with authoring, heritage work, journalism, and um, broadcasting as well. Some of the work you're going to get to see shortly. Um, and I'm hoping that whilst you guys here are doing all this amazing work to try and make being a Muslim so much more easier from a practical perspective, hopefully you'll see with my work, the aim is to try and give us some anchorage, heritage, and some roots in a place where we are normally made to feel like we don't belong. And the question that I'm going to try and answer today is this, is there a Muslim Europe? Now, anybody who knows the picture in front already knows the answer, but we'll get to that shortly. Um, and I'm going to try and answer this question by providing you with an overview of Europe's historic and living indigenous Muslim presence. And we'll talk about why that's important, the indigenous aspect. Um, and I'm going to use my own work to remind you of the living indigenous European Muslim culture and then also to show you a glimpse of an overlooked and rich British Muslim heritage. Some of you have already had that glimpse in the brief five minutes Saleh gave me at the Ramadan event. Hopefully this time we'll go, go into a bit more depth and you'll be able to appreciate it better. So we're going to start with... Are you going to do it or should I? I can pop in there now. Right, that's fine. So we'll start with this space. Um, if anyone's ever been to Cyprus, um, you may have heard about this. And the reason it's called the Hale Sultan Teki is because it is reportedly the final resting place of a woman named Um Harun, who reportedly is a maternal aunt to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, how is it that we have one of the first generation of Muslims in Europe? And yet we have this issue of whether or not Muslims actually belong in Europe. And that's the journey I'm about to take you on. Um, um Harun died in Cyprus in 649. She was part of a Muslim fleet that arrived um, in the 7th century. And the fact that this piece of history, which has been verified, the tomb itself hasn't been verified, but the history is verified and we know, all the scholars know whether they're Muslim or not, that this is a fact. Muslims landed in Europe within decades of Islam being announced to the world. So, we can categorically say Muslim Europe is 14 centuries old. And then we get to the more glorious part of Muslim Europe, shall we say. Between 711 and 1492, those of you that have studied a bit of Islamic history or heritage may be aware that a cultured and flourishing Abrahamic civilization existed in Spain or Iberia because it was both Spain, well it was more than Spain and Portugal, it was also in Sicily and there were these great achievements during this period and a largely tolerant society where Muslims, Jews and Christians lived in relative harmony. And the pinnacle of that particular civilization came in 929 AD, when Abdurrahman III declares himself Khalif. During this period, we had seven centuries of indigenous Muslim civilization. But of course, that ended in 1492. And this is part of the problem, shall we say, if there is a problem indeed. Because while some of us are aware of this Spanish history and this Muslim presence, and whilst even Western Europe is willing to acknowledge it, as far as they're concerned, that's a dead history. That's gone. And this is why the work that I'm going to talk to you about, my book here, has been taken and received so well by both Muslims and non-Muslims. Because when the Muslims and Jews were being kicked out of Iberia, many of them made their way over to this part of the world that I cover in this book. And this particular book is looking at Europe's living indigenous Muslim communities. And the question that it tries to, or should we say, the issue that it tries to grapple with 
is to convince Europe to embrace its own Islamic self. Because it seems Europe's not comfortable with that at all. And the book came about from a journey that my family and I took over an entire summer of six weeks where we went in search of this Islamic self. We wanted to go and discover what we believe to be our European Muslim heritage and the reasons why it had been denied, why we weren't aware of it, why it wasn't a part of the popular discussion and narrative are things that we can come to shortly. And that's kind of the journey I'm going to try and take you on. Um, and to take you there, I'm just going to give you an overview of the route because of course I don't have the time um, to talk about every single aspect of the journey. Um, but the route we took was picked for particular reasons. You see, it begins here in Sarajevo. One of the tables must surely be called Sarajevo. That's us. That's you guys. Okay. Sarajevo is a Muslim city through and through. It was founded by the Ottomans. And so we wanted to begin there. Sarajevo was also known as Jerusalem of Europe, but we'll come to that later. And then we did what was broadly speaking a kind of circular route back to Sarajevo. And we went through Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Albania, Montenegro. And three of those countries are Muslim countries. So there are Muslim countries in Europe. And here we are having this discussion, which is probably the most shocking thing. Why are they Muslim countries? Because like the country of my birth, Bangladesh, constitutionally it's a secular nation. But we all call it a Muslim country because the population is majority Muslim, as is the case in Bosnia, Kosovo, Albania. In fact, in Kosovo, it's almost over 90%. The other thing I want to draw your attention to, oh, sorry, is this gentleman up here, depicted. Um, his name is Elia Chelevi. He's a 17th century Ottoman traveler, and he kind of joins me on this journey as well. And the reason that I needed Elia Chelebi with me is because Elia Chelebi traveled through all of this and some more when it was the most Muslim it will probably ever be. This, of course, you know, the prophecy is fulfilled. Um, in the sense that Elia Chelebi was moving through this region just after the zenith, the absolute pinnacle of the Ottoman Empire. And so what I had was this tantalizing window into just how amazing that Muslim culture was. And I was able to compare and contrast. But I had to go all the way back to the 17th century to find that. Because all the other writing, all the other English writing, and of course Elia's writing had to be translated for me to access it, all the other English writing on this region was written by non-Muslims. And that comes with a lot of issues that we will look at later. So Elia is very, very important because when he is traveling through here, he is looking at his heritage. And that's what I wanted. I wanted somebody embracing this heritage, not seeing it as foreign, not seeing it as the other, not seeing it as alien. And that's why having Evelia's lens adds so much more color to the journey that we went on. Now I'm gonna show you a few images, and for each image, I'm gonna try and take you to a different place on here and try and draw out some of the themes that I tried to tackle in the book that come through from the journey as well. And we start off here in Mostar. And Mostar um, is the Balkan word for bridge because the entire town is named after this, Stari Most. As somebody who wants to understand his Muslim heritage, his Muslim culture, wider culture, it made me upset that there was this whole group of people in Europe who have been there for centuries and I knew nothing about them. It's a mystical brand of Islam that is found widely across the Balkans and was initially spread largely because the Yanissaris, the Sultan's very intimate um, court, were some of the key followers of it. But the other reason I love this space, as well as the fact that it's this magical lodge, you know, beneath, at the, at the mouth of a um, river which comes bubbling up, a sheer rock hanging over it, as well as being one of the most peaceful places I've been to, it was also where Evia Chelebi actually stayed. And it was one, the first place that I felt like I intimately connected with Evia Chelebi. Uh, this is a gold coin that was minted in the 8th century, do the maths, in the 8th century by an Anglo-Saxon king known as King Offa. Offa Rex. And around the edge, it has the Shahada. And it sits in the British Museum. You can go and see it yourself. It's no secret. Well, it is a secret because nobody's talking about it. 
We don't know why he minted it, but we do know it was a conscious effort. He wouldn't have put his name there. They weren't just copying. They weren't just making these. These weren't just coins that they took from traders and continued to trade. This was a conscious decision. He wanted to put his name in this coin's center. It also plays homage to the then Khalif in Baghdad as well, because of course they were the most powerful rulers, the Abbasids at the time. So whatever the reasons for it, what we do know, what we can categorically state is that Islam arrived on these shores 12 centuries ago. And it was important enough for England's most powerful king to be minting gold Islamic coins. Last Nizams of Hyderabad, the then powerful Muslim family in India. We also have, well actually I'll come, the, I'll go there last. Some of you may know this gentleman. He is the famous English convert and translator of the Quran known as Muhammad Mahmudu Pikto. Mm whose translation is probably one of the most widely read English translations in the world to this day. He was the first native speaking English person who was Muslim to, come, um, to translate the Quran. This is why the, the language in that, in that particular translation was so phenomenal that Al-Azhar University, the then authority, endorsed it. And finally, in the top left hand corner, just to give you the kind of you know, histories that we don't know about, I doubt any of you would have seen this particular individual because she came about through some research that we did. It turns out that buried in this particular cemetery is a direct British descendant of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Princess Musba Haider is a daughter of the ex-Grand Sharif of Makkah. But I'm not going to tell you why she's there, that's for you to go and do your homework. Okay, this is all of the history that you've seen up here today. Thank you very much.